Hey guys, we're starting soon. Hang in there. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the tips, tools, and techniques for October. How did we get here? It's October. Um, this is Tips, Tools, and Techniques Club at the Sewing Studio in Maitland, Florida. Welcome. Lots of scrappy goodness for you today. You know, this club, a long time ago, um, 13, 14 years ago, we used to call it scra Stash Busters. And now we call it Tips, Tools, and Techniques because it's way more than just using up your stash, way more than scraps. But today, it's going to be all about scraps, strings, squares, um, whatever you got. So stay tuned. Got a few announcements here. Very exciting. We have a giveaway at the end of the morning. So these items, we've got a Riley Blake, really nice metal vacuum sealed um, uh, canteen, and then a beautiful um, jelly roll. So we're going to give those away um, to one lucky person at the end of the live broadcast. So if you want in on this, you're going to comment with hashtag TTT, no spaces, uppercase. You got to do it just that way. Otherwise, the system won't recognize your comment. So comment that once during the live broadcast. And then at the end of the live broadcast, we will pull a name in front of you and you'll be able to see if you're the winner. And get back with us if you're the winner. So that's pretty exciting. Another announcement is we have a shop hop going on. Sorry, I should have looked. In November, November 18th to December 3rd, spans two weekends. There are nine shops. And if you get a stamp on your passport, the passport, by the way, is $7. If you get a stamp on all nine slots, turn it in you get put in for one of nine grand prizes. Grand prizes are $75. There's going to be nine of them. $75 gift card from um, each shop. And then the second gift is a $50 gift, $50 um, prize gift card from each of those nine shops. So you guys, if you've ever been to Shop Hop, you know you go from place to place. The shops always have good deals. Uh, and what this shop is, is called a splash of color. And you're going to get a pattern and a kit for a block. And if you make all nine blocks, your quilt could look like this, um, or you could make it look like something else. This is just one possible design. And I bet if you sh shop at all nine stores, they've got these blocks set up completely different ways to give you some design ideas. So anyway, Shop Pop, November 18th to December 3rd. Be there, be square. Pick up your... Um, Pick up your passport from us, and uh, we'd love to we'd love to see it in. Okay, so that's a shop hub, and then I wanted to tell you about a few classes that I have that are not. I was just checking to make sure none of these classes are completely full. So I have a binding class that has two more openings, and it's December fifth on a Monday. It's three hours. I teach you how to bind a quilt, and also about sleeves, and also about labels. This qu particular quilt that I'll be talking about is actually flange binding, which I won't be talking about, but it's basically using all the all the binding techniques that I'll be talking about, except for a couple. I've got a machine quilting class on November 12th. I believe it's full, but put yourself in for um, on the waiting list, and then you'll be first in line for the class. I'll do it again in January. I do it once or twice a quarter. And then once or twice a year, I try to do it on the weekend to catch those people who work during the week and can't take off. I have some openings in my quilting basics class. It, everything, soup to nuts. If you need to learn how to choose fabric, um, cut fabric with a rotary cutter, how to press seams properly, how to sew seams with a scant quarter of an inch, all the way to basting, quilting, and binding. You're gonna get that entire, all of that information, plus all of your questions answered um, in six hours. So it's two, two one morning, two morning classes and I've got some openings in, um, I guess one starts Monday. I, got, I think there's two openings and then actually the December class is on a Saturday and it's full, but hey, you know, put yourself on the waiting list. Things open up all the time. Quilting with a walking foot. If you want to just test the waters and see what that's about, that's coming up in November and I have a 
actually I got one on Friday that had some openings, I think. And then I have an evening class in November. So again, if you work, we can, we'll get you there. Um, we're going to put up a picture of my quilty fun quilt along quilt. We just had our first class, <coughs> excuse me, our first class on Thursday, and we're going to do it um, every, every um, two weeks. Well, in, in this quarter, it's kind of weird. We've got three more dates in this quarter, but next quarter will be every two weeks, mostly on Thursday mornings. If you're interested in having an evening class or a Saturday class for Quilty Fun, let us know and we'll try to do that. And then finally, I've got a little show and tell here. You saw this last month, maybe, if you were tuning in, but this is um, Improv Curves. So I'm teaching a class on introduction to improvisational curves. I cut all these curves just with my eyeball and my rotary cutter. I didn't use a ruler. I didn't use any, any measurements. And also you can, kind of, you can kind of see the quilting on this. I used a walking foot to quilt this. So we'll be talking about that as well in my quilting with a walking foot class, which I believe is, oh no, it's November. That's the evening class. You know, I forgot to say, forgot to talk about quilting with a with a ruler ruler foot. And so that's coming up. I can't remember the dates. I do. That's what I have on Fridays, quilting with a ruler foot. Anyway, this is a walking foot. And, um, but first you would learn how to piece it, improv piecing. So if you're interested in improv piecing, or you're saying, you know, this scant quarter inch thing is really hard, um, then improv piecing might be the way for you to go. You don't have to worry so much about that quarter inch seam. So again, um, introduction to improv curves, November 21st, it's a Monday. And um, that is a class I'm looking forward to because we're gonna have some fun. If you have questions, you know me, I love questions. Please put them, please hit it with the comments with your questions, let us know where you're from. And also ask questions and I'm here for you. I love questions because that really lets me know that you're listening and you've got questions. Uh, I mean, you've got, you're listening and you're paying attention and that's, that's all good. Okay. Thank you, um, Tony. It is a beautiful quilt behind me. I'm, I'm going to talk about it next because I think that was all my announcements. I'll tell you a few more times about the giveaway. So if you're just tuning in, there is a giveaway. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. So pineapple quilt. We, um, oh yes, thank you. We've got, a, we've got another announcement that we just put up there. So no more, no tips, tools, and techniques in November and December because the fourth Saturday is right there on the, um, on the holiday weekend. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to be here on a holiday weekend. And then in starting in January, st always on the fourth Saturday, we're going to big change. We're going to be in the event room Saturday morning. So that's live in person, face to face in the event room. And then one o'clock in the afternoon, that same day, we're going to be here face to, um, live virtually on Facebook or YouTube, however you watch us. So that's a big change for those of you who work or can't get here on Mondays. We're going to be here on instead on Saturday morning. So no more Monday, no more Friday. It's going to be, um, it's going to be Saturday morning the way it used to be BC before COVID. Um, yes. All right. So I think that was all the announcements. Now we could talk about the quilt behind me. Lots going on here. This is a pineapple quilt. I think I've mentioned this before, but when you take a class from me or even just send me an email, you know, Mary Janine, I would really like to learn more about whatever. I had a student say, um, I would really like to learn more about pineapple quilt. So I did some research and I found this great book and ruler that we'll be talking about, Trash to Treasure. Um, and I basically used the leftover bits. Let's go big here. And then you can put up my put up my picture again of my uh, Quilty Fun. I used the leftover fabrics from the Quilty Fun quilt along of that picture you just saw a few minutes ago. And we'll put the picture up here in just a second. Um, so there was there were, were lots of leftovers. I used a, a nice big stack of fat quarters. They were all tied together in a little, pretty little bow. And to be honest, I used a little bit less than half of the fabric for the first quilt. So I was like, what else can I do with this beautiful fabric? So now you're looking at it. Um, and I used up just about everything. I'll be honest, there were some browns and a few greens in that pack that I didn't use very much of. There are some browns in here, but I, I still have lots of browns left. Um, 
Chris, interesting variation of color placement on the pineapple. Two different kinds of block. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. Gabriella, could you move that light for me so I can see the strings? Um, so yes, there are two different blocks. You've got this block here, which is, um, this is actually a pattern called X's and O's. So this is the O's, and then these are the X's. And I'm going to show you in the book uh, what we've, the, the, what it looks like. Um, so she talks about how to use the ruler and I'm gonna show you how to use the ruler in a minute, but she's got a pattern here. So you've got all these different beautiful um, pineapple, uh, this, this is the one I was gonna talk about, but you can see there's lots of different pineapple quilts in here. And, yep, there it is. There we go. And, oh, and then she's got she's got um, um, uh, recipes too, which is cool because we have probably 50 or 60 different pineapple plants in our yard. So it's I'm gonna be looking forward to using up some of these uh, using some of these recipes. Anyway, so the one that she calls X's and O's, it kind of appealed to me because thank you. It appealed to me because it had lots of white to kind of break up all the scrappiness of the of the quilt. And so I also had a lot of white left over from my quilt. And you would really have to just dive in deep to look at my quilt to notice that it's not just one white fabric. You certainly could use one white fabric, but I used lots of different, lots of different whites. Um, there you can see a little bit of a gray one here and some polka dots. So it's really fun to dive into your neutral stash and see what you can find as far as white, white on white or some neutral. We also call those low volume fabrics. So I don't know about you, but I am just always looking for another, another piece of low volume fabric. And that's, this is kind of the place they go. Yeah. Lots of, lots of good stuff in there. So I want to do a little demo for you on this pineapple. This is going to be a class January or February timeframe because I, it's a great technique that I, that um, I think it would be fun to do. So when you buy the book separately is the pineapple ruler. And I'm going to, I just want to show, show you what it looks like without the lines. So it has some special lines on those and I'll show you what those are. If you're wondering what this uh, cream colored thing is, it's some plastic tape that I got to put on the back. So this ruler doesn't, doesn't shift on my fabric. Another thing I want to talk about, if you don't have one of these, is and this is on my favorites page by the way it's a suction cup holder this is the this is the packaging um and it's awesome because um it creates it, it makes the ruler a part of your hand so instead of having to get in here i don't know about you but i have no fingernails so trying to get in here and pick this up or move it off to the edge so you can lift it it just becomes part of your an extension of your hand, which I love. So the rulers that I use on a regular basis, they all have some kind of suction device because you know me, I am Mrs. Efficient. I want, I want something that's gonna make me as efficient as possible. So my suction cup is awesome. Um, so I've got some, I've got some blocks here that I'm that I pre-made for this. So we always start out with a two and a half inch square. And then we're gonna sew, you can see it's super scrappy. I'm gonna sew. Uh, pieces on all four sides of it. And our first time that we trim, by the way, we always trim from the, the back, but the first time we trim, we're going to use this set of lines here, and that's going to snug right up on the edge of that squared fabric. So we're going to make that cut. And then this is really nice. I put this in my favorites because this is an awesome um, I don't have one at home, so I've gotten used to turning the fabric, but it's really nice to be able to leave the fabric right where it's at and turn the board instead. Um, and then when I start, I'm starting to, um, before I cut that, I kind of eyeball this and make sure that looks good. I don't, you know, if it's doing something like this, you know, there's something wrong. So that's got to be kind of lined up with that cut edge and the same thing here. So that looks good. And then finally one more cut. And again, I'm lining up, lining up these diagonal. This is the only time, actually there's two times I'm gonna do that. And then after that, we're gonna do it a different way. So that's the first, the first trim. So every time you sew four pieces on, you go and trim it. So you know me, I'm not doing one at a time. I'm doing 10, 15 at a time. Sew all four, well actually sew two sides, press it open, 
So the other two sides, press it open and then bring it to my cutting board. And then I, and I've got them all lined up. So now I'm going to sew four more edges on. Can you see that? Whoop, close my blade. So I've got these set up the same way. There's my white. And now I'm going to sew two pieces on this side and then iron and then two pieces on this side and iron. All right. So I'm going to flip this over and we're going to trim this out again. What's nice when you trim it, trim things out each time is you just have a perfect product. You don't have to wait till the end to find out, oh man, I am so far off. So here I can line up these lines with my first square and then I'm gonna line up that diagonal with the second square. Here we go. Whoops, and I can, <laughs> I'm so used to having to turn this, um, turn the fabric. But anyway, you can you can begin to see what's going on here. We're going to turn the fabric and trim it four times. So whenever you're making pineapples, this is usually the way that the way it goes. You have to keep trimming over and over again. Um, so if you're not sure where you're supposed to cut, just look for these weird ends here and like, oh, yeah, I really want to cut those off. So how do I set up my ruler to make sure that I'm cutting those off properly? And there we go. OK, so there it is. Clean up my space here. Rulers are good for more than one thing. All right. So there's my second cut. Oops. All right. And then we're just going to keep going. Um, I, I accidentally cut, cut the next one, but then I put another set on. So we're going to put another set of white and another set of color, and you're just going to keep trimming. Thank you. And then I, what I wanted to show you was... After those first two cuts, what's really nice is I can use, start using these lines here. I'm lining up this and I'm lining up this. And now I can cut two sides at a time, which is a really nice savings of time and effort. I only have to set up the ruler twice instead of setting up the ruler four times. So I'm lining up here and I'm lining up here. And I could just kind of check my work here. Everything looks good and we're good to go. So that's been trimmed again. So you just keep going until, until you get to something that looks like this. And then a lot of times you'll have these pieces that are you've trimmed off and they're still big enough to use. And that's when you could start adding them onto the corners because I'll need to add two more strips onto each corner to square it up. And then I can take, I only did two sides, but you get the idea. Now I can take my ruler and I can cut all four sides at once. So one, two, and then three, and then four if, if I needed to, if, you know, if there was, so there it is. I'll just cover this up. But you can, you can see how, oops, I didn't do that very well because it was, it was uh, not pressed properly probably not pressed at all. So then we'll just recut that, line everything up. And there it is. So that's, we're going to do a big picture over here, Gabrielle. That's, um, again, this, that's going to be this block with the X. And then with the O, of course, you would do color, 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 color. And then the very last row would be, would be in white. So it's two different rows. You certainly don't have to make this particular one. There's, I forget to, forgot to count, but there's plenty of, plenty of choices in here for this book. So uh, what's really nice is you can absolutely use, you know, sometimes she uses fabric that all goes together, but then sometimes she's just pure scrappy, which looks like that one's kind of scrappy and that one's very scrappy. So yeah, lots of choices. It's a great book to use up your stash. If you have an AccuQuilt cutter with a one and a half inch strip die or a friend that has one, this is a good time to pull out the one and a half inch strips because that's what you're using for this particular um, um, quilt is one and a half strips for everything except the center, which is a two and a half inch square. So book and ruler are both on my favorites page. So take a look. And again, I'll be teaching this class January, February, March timeframe of next year. I can't believe we're in the 23. Um, so, so yeah, so if there's any questions about that, love to see them. Um, don't forget, hello, Susan from Melbourne and Dundee, Florida. I have to remind us where Dundee is. I know where a lot of places are, but I, I don't think I remember where Dundee is. Um, 
And I'm going to tell you again, if you've just been joining us, we have a giveaway that's going to happen at the end of the, the end of the live broadcast. We are giving away to one lucky person, two items, a jelly roll strip from Riley Blake and a really nice metal canteen from Riley Blake. Um, these are nice. This is, this is the kind of thing I have when it's a, uh, it's got two layers. It's got vacuum sealed. I can keep my ice will keep for like a day and a half. So very nice, very nice canteen with a little carabiner and a loop. So anyway, one lucky person. So what you need to do is put in the comments, hashtag TTT, no spaces during the live broadcast. And at the end, we will pull one name and we'll, it'll be live and you'll be able to see us pulling a name mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to uh, connect with us if you are the winner. So very exciting. All right. Any questions, please let us know. Hello from Apopka. And oh, so talk a little bit more about this quilt. Um, I want to talk about the flange binding, which I am just so in love with. Whenever I have a quilt with solid fabric border, not a pieced border, I like to do a flange binding because it, I think it just adds so much to the quilt. Um, so the reason I don't do it on pieced borders is because it's a quarter of an inch and then a little bit more. And you don't want to be covering up those pretty, you know, um, triangle, triangle points or whatever with that extra flange. But this is a lot easier than you think it is. So um, please give it a try. So we're going to do a quick demo. Oh, so I forgot to mention we have handouts. So Gabrielle is going to put up a little comment uh, and tell you where the handout is. Probably a lot of you have already printed it out or put it up on another screen. Uh, if you have not, now would be a good time to do that because the first, not what I'm going to talk about now is your first handout. There are actually five pages of handout, so it's a good stuff. So I'm going to take a quick break while you're getting your handout up. Too much ice. Okay, so flange binding. Let's talk about it. Normally, you cut your binding um, two and a quarter. I do two and a quarter because I want my my binding on the edge of my quilt to be exactly um, a quarter of an inch. Um, and again, the reason is is if if you have a pieced, your pieces go all the way to the end. If you have a half an inch binding, you're covering up some of your piecing and that's not good. So it's good to just, just get used to doing a quarter inch binding. Um, so I cut my binding two and a quarter inches wide. Um, Gabriella, I forgot to print out a copy and you, I guess of my handout, you probably don't have one either. So we'll just do, try to do it out of my head. Um, we, we forgot to do that. Um, anyway, the re the way I the, the place I got this inspiration from there it is the place I got this inspiration from is Missouri Star Quilt Company and Jenny Doan likes two and a half inch binding, so her numbers are a little different than mine. If you notice, kind of in the middle of the handout on the left, she has for two for two and a half inch wide binding. I wrote, you're going to need uh, you know this wide of your flange fabric, and then this wide for your binding fabric, right? But for me and my two and a quarter, I cut my numbers a little bit different and they're on the right. So I cut the flange binding, the yellow is gonna be my flange and the gray is gonna be what you're mostly gonna see on the outside. And believe it or not, you're gonna cut more of the flange color than you are of the outside binding color. So that's what we've got here. This is one and a, one and a, half inches in the yellow and then the gray it's kind of got a got a pleat here and then the gray is actually one and a quarter and there it is sewed together um yeah so what what happens is you're going to need to cut you're going to need to measure all the way around your quilt and cut that much gray measure all the way around your quilt and cut that much yellow and you're going to sew them together lengthwise all the way. Let's say if it's 250 inches, that's what you're gonna to need to make, really long. And that's really the only difference um, here for this flange binding and the way you put it on, uh, it may be the way you, you've been putting on binding anyway. Okay, so now we've got this. Let's do an overhead, Gabriella. 
All right, so here's here's my little quilt. This is the front. This is the front and this is the back. Okay, so black is back. I'm going to sew my binding to the back of my quilt with the flange color pointing up at me. And I'm going to go all the way around just like I normally do with binding. And if you've been binding for a while, you know what I mean. If you haven't been binding, take my binding class. But we, we go to the corner, we sew to the corner, we uh, fold this around, and then we start from the top and we sew down just the way you do regular binding. Okay. And again, it's either I teach this in two different classes. I teach it in my binding class and also in my beginner quilting class, I teach this technique. Let's say we went all the way around, closed up the, closed up the two ends, and now we're ready to flip the quilt over and we're ready to sew down the binding. So this is going to come around and look at that. You thought you had to build piping or something. There it is. There's my flange right there because it's a little bit extra yellow than black, right? So I'm going to take my walking foot and I'm going to take a very thin thread like a, um, a size 100 Invisifil, which is my favorite. And I'm going to go right into that ditch and I'm going to sew down on that ditch. And just the way we always do with binding, we bring up the bottom first, put our finger there and pinch it, bring this over and we get a beautiful, beautiful mitered binding. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. Pivot, turn, do the same thing. Come around here, pit, uh, miter, pivot, turn, and we go around. So again, it's easier than it looks and it is stunning. It is so effective as a quilt. Um, as a quilt binding to finish up your quilt. And it really, except for the fact that you've had to cut two different strips and then sew them in half, the rest of it is almost the same, especially if you're used to going around twice um, and twice in your go around. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, um, do I baste the flange? I do not baste the flange. I basically sew the flange um, to the, the flange fabric to the binding fabric. I just sew it. I just, you know, sew it down, piece it together, two scraps. Um, JK says she's once been, been wanting to make a pineapple quilt for years. Yes, so have I. So I finally got the impetus. So, so Miriam, who's one of my students, asked for it a few months ago, and here we go. So the finished size for the pineapple quilt, one, two, three, four, five, it's six by seven blocks. And the blocks are eight inches each. So that's, have to do the math. Um, six, by, six by eight is 48 plus another eight inches. So this quilt is about 56 by 64-ish. Yeah, that's about the size. Okay. Any other questions? Are you sewing both ends on the back? Um, well, you would... You would, however you like to put your binding, however you like to sew your ends together, um, I don't really have a demo for that. I teach it in my binding class, but you put your ends together the way that you normally would, however, however you do that. I teach a couple different methods in my, in my binding class, but yeah, you put those together and then it's all, it's all on the back and then you flip it around to the front and you sew it down to the front. So there's lots of YouTubes out there for, um, how do you finish the binding where the two ends meet? Um, again, that's in my binding class, JK. I don't have, I don't have that demo here because I didn't think to take, bring it. I just wanted to show you flange binding. Um, but I'm sure if you go online, I've been, I've seen a lot of, a lot of demos on binding and they're all great. So, um, use one of those. Okay. Any other questions about the flange binding or the pineapples? Uh, again, the pineapples always finish up to be eight and a half inches unfinished or eight, eight inch square um, blocks. Yes. All right. Uh, drag it corn. No, the first time around. I'm not sure what you, oh, are you, are you sewing both ends on the back? Yes, on the first time around, you have to have a way to put those those two ends together on the first go around. And yes, and then once you bring it once you bring it over, if you've done your if you've done it properly, then you're not even going to notice 
where those two ends came together. It's, it's very simple. Um, uh, Kathy, if you want to join the part of a class, when should we start? Should we start saving scraps now? Of course. Um, and Kathy, I believe you are in my, uh, my cult along class. So those would be good scraps to keep. And I actually, I have some extras I was going to bring for those of you in my, in my quilt along class that have that, this particular set of fabrics, I've got some scraps you can have. Pat wants to know how long to complete this quilt. Um, are you asking about the class or just in general? I made this quilt um, in about, well, off and on, it took me about three weeks. I started it after the last TTNT and I've been, it's funny because I Zoom with my family every, every uh, Sunday afternoon and every time they saw it, there would be more blocks and more blocks and then last, Last week, I was able to show them the finished block, so they were excited about it. Um, how? What size AccuQuilt die for the pineapple scraps? One and a half inch wide strips. One and a half inch wide strips. Um, all right, any other questions? Good stuff, thank you for the questions. And that was flange binding, give it a try on the handout. I link you to the, um, the actual video from Missouri Star, and she does a great job as well. So you could watch that if you want to. That's that's uh, midway down. Um, yes. All right. Let me know those questions if you got them. And while you're thinking of a question, I'm going to pull up the next quilt. The back is just the blue fabric from the... Um, from the border and then the quilting is was a very simple um, swirly thing that I do. Yeah, we can do a close up here. I don't know if you can see the swirls. Yeah, you can kind of see them. Um, so just some free handed, free handed spirals that came out. And that's that's my that's my pattern du jour lately. It's if I don't know what else to do. Oh, and then you know what? Let's do a close up on the on the border. I talked about this on Monday with everybody, but this is something called hooked on hooked on feathers. So if you've ever done feather quilting and you're really just lost because you have to do a lot of backtracking, this pattern, I love it because there's no backtracking. So we've just followed my finger. We you know, pause for a second. You know that when you ever want to come to a point when you're quilting, you have to pause your hands and then come around back to the spine and then pause your hand and back to the spine. So there's no backtracking. But if you don't look really closely, it looks like feathers. So I love this design and I love it on borders because it's a forward design. So you never have to back up the way I do it. I just, it just, you just keep going round and round the quilt, three passes around the quilt and you've done, you've done all the feathers. So I mark my spine with a chalk and then I go from there. So check out this quilt behind me. I love the way it looks. I'm going to move this. And I'm actually going to pull the bottom up for just a minute so you can see the whole quilt. I'm going to move our beautiful canteen. So it's a Christmas tree and it's on the handout, a free pattern on your handout. So I used a collection of red and green plaids and stripes from shirting. And then I used lots of neutrals. Some of my neutrals are from shirting, but most of them were just from my collection of shirting, I'm sorry, just collection of neutrals. Um, candy cane border, do you love this? My brother said, oh, I'm getting hungry for candy canes. He liked the candy cane border. Um, so I was inspired by a quilt that was kind of similar to it on Pinterest um, that was not a pattern for sale. So I thought, well, I, I really like this. I actually came up with this idea two years ago, or yeah, a year and a half ago, and then I forgot to do it last Christmas. So here it is for this Christmas. And you know, if you work really hard, you have however many days left before Christmas. You can do this. Two months, two months before Christmas. Um, basically, it's half square triangles. It's half square triangles for the tree and the candy cane border. And then it's solid. So these are four and a half inches unfinished, unfinished background squares, four and a half inches. I'll, I'll do a little demo. And then the star at the top is I actually used my value die from AccuQuilt. So these are two and a half inch half square triangles, two and a half inch plain half square triangles, and these are two and a half inch solids. So it's four, four blocks made up my star, but you know what? If you have a star that you like even more, 
um, you should use that. So I'm going to do a quick overhead demo here. So here we go. I started with, let's, let's make one of the candy cane pieces. I started with a five inch red square and a five inch neutral square. So um, cut, cut lots of five inch. And this is just for the half square triangles, not for the background fabrics. Five inch, five inch, kiss them together. I like to kiss them together on the ironing board to make sure they don't move around too much. We're gonna draw a line. It could be, you can use anything. You could use a pen, you could use a Frixon pen. It doesn't matter because it's gonna get cut off. So we draw a line horizontally. The line is starting to go away, but there's my line horizontally. I sewed on either side of it. It's You can easily see it here where my white sewing lines. And then, oh, I gotta get my cutting board back. I forgot I needed it for another demo. Okay. So, <laughs> all right, so we're gonna cut that in half. There's my ruler and my rotary cutter. So we're going to cut that in half. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut on that drawn line, which is kind of disappearing, but I can see it cause I'm kind of up close. So I'm gonna cut those in half. So now I have two, you guys have done this before, I'm sure you have, two half square triangles, right? The technique I'm about to show you though, allows me to cut, trim this off. Cause I don't know about you, but trimming is like my least favorite. You know, if somebody would ask me what I don't like doing in quilting, it would be trimming. And I'm gonna do anything I can to avoid trimming, which is why I love triangulations. Uh, which is, means no trimming, but for this size square, triangulation is a little bit of a uh, of a waste because you can only fit a few of these on a piece of paper. So this is why I like this tool because instead of having to trim four sides, you know, normally you pick this up, you put a ruler down, trim, trim, and then you have to flip it over and trim, trim. So that's four trims. In this case, I'm only going to trim two sides. So I'm going to leave my triangle as I cut it. This particular tool is called the slotted trimmer. And between the two triangles, you get eight different sizes. Let me do this one because it's not shiny. This is the one from home. You got 11 different size um, half square triangles, one and a half inch all the way up to six and a half inches, which is awesome. So these two different rulers give you all those sizes. So today we're gonna to use this ruler. So I wanna cut them into four and a half inch unfinished half square triangles. So I'm gonna look for the four and a half inch line. And that dot, dot, dot line is gonna line up to my terrible sewing line. It looks it's a little bit, a little bit curvy, but anyway, it's, it's pretty good. So I'm gonna put the dotted line on my sewed line and I'm going to trim and trim. And then I don't think I got that very well. I'm gonna do it again. Yeah, a little bit. No, I did. Okay. And then a little bonus here, you have little slots where you can take off the dog ears before. Yeah, so check this out. Done and done. So it's a beautiful half square triangle. It's been trimmed. The dog ears are gone. Um, yeah, with, with one set of trimming, one putting the ruler down, figuring it all out, rather than having to move things around multiple times. Somebody, I just got an email from, the, from somebody this morning who saw my demonstration on Monday. She went and got this. She loves it. She says game changer. It is a game changer. Um, so yeah, so this is called the Clearly Perfect Slotted Trimmer. We've got it on my favorites page. I actually learned about it again, Missouri Star Quilt Company. She's awesome. Jenny, Jenny Doan has got a lot of great ideas and um, I learned about it from her. There's lots of ways to make half square triangles and this is one of many, but for this size, if I don't have my AccuQuilt cutter for that particular size, this is how I do my half square triangles because it's, it's efficient and it's perfect. So we've got a question. Can you use the AccuQuilt half square triangle? Of course you can. In fact, um, I just realized I, I um, want to make more quilts with just half square triangles. And so I just yesterday actually bought a four inch finished 
triangle die so I could make this quilt, but I could make other quilts too, because I just love half square triangles. Somebody at church recently gave me a, or asked me to fix an old quilt. Her grandmother had made it. So it was 40, 50 year old quilt. And it was just simply half square triangles and lots of colors. So I had to do a lot of repair work, but I was just, I just really love that quilt. It was really nothing special, but it was just, maybe it was just filled with so much love. I just felt the love. I don't know, but I just like, oh my gosh, it's such a simple pattern. Just half square triangles sewed together in maybe 10 different colors. And I was just so enthralled by that quilt that I went and I'm getting the, getting the AccuQuilt die for that so I can start making quilts like that with my scraps. So maybe one day you'll see some of those in my scraps. Any other questions? Jan says she's got the tool and she loves it. Me too. Uh, do I do virtual classes? Uh, C. Lombardi. I do not. This is this is about as virtual as I get. And the reason is, is I'm a very hands on teacher. I like to walk around, check on people. Oh, yeah, no, you need to turn it this way or whatever. And if I'm doing that virtually, you're not I'm, you're not going to get your money's worth out of me because I can't I can't help you. I can't help you in person. So I like to I really like to teach virtual. Sorry in-person classes. Um, so keep watching TTNT. I don't think we'll ever stop doing virtual tips, tools, and techniques because we get, we get people watching from all over the country and all over the world. So um, hi, Pat Flogel. I don't know if you're watching or your wife is watching, but I'm glad to see you. Enjoy your vacation. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna jump in one more time. Well, at least one more time and tell you we've got, we've got a um, giveaway today at the end of this live broadcast we're going to give away these two items to one lucky person so if you want to win you've probably been wondering what all the comments are hashtag ttt no spaces put that in the comments and at the end of the live broadcast we'll pull one lucky winner and you'll get both a jelly roll and a beautiful metal canteen so that's our giveaway for the day i think that's kind of fun um what else did I want to tell you about this quilt? So let's do a close up, Gabriella, about the, the quilting. Finished the quilting last night, as per usual. But it is, I quilted with a walking foot. And if you're thinking that I went around each one, I did not. It kind of looks like I might have, but it was way simpler than that. I started at the top and I went through this point and I curved to the left, went through the point and curved to the right, went through this point and curved to the left. I did, went uh, vertically twice to get both sides and then horizontally twice to get both sides. And um, yeah, it took some time. It took some time, but I think it was well worth it. Um, we talk about this in my walking foot class, which I'll be teaching again on the evening in November. Um, and so this will be one of my uh, class samples when I talk about how to quilt with a walking foot. But I feel like my blocks are small enough that it really, it, wor it works well. It's a great pattern. And if you've ever heard me talking about free motion quilting, you know that you should be going through as many intersections as you possibly can. Because if I were to wash and dry and wash and dry this quilt, the first thing that's going to get worn down are my little mountain corners, right? This is, there's what, eight different pieces of fabric in this corner and it's gonna be a little mountain and it's gonna stick out in your laundry and it's gonna get worn down. And that's what's gonna get torn or worn first in the laundry or just wear, right? So I like to nail down as many intersections as I can with my quilting. So I figured not only is it a great pattern, but it nails down all my intersections. Um, Debbie, we're looking forward to seeing you in Florida next week for the winter. Love Florida. And then I'll be seeing you wherever you are in the summer because I get out of the heat in the summer. Um, we're already, already thinking about where we're going to go next year. Um, still not sure, but Canadian Maritimes are looking real good right now. Um, okay, so, oh yeah. And then one more thing. I quilted it or I backed it with a, with a beautiful Christmas plaid. And so I had some leftover, we could do a close up on this. I had some leftover um, backing. So I bound it with the plaid and I cut the plaid on a by on the bias edge. And so it gives a beautiful, beautiful um, plaid bias binding. I just love that binding so much. So, and I picked a good corner because my triangles, triangle didn't get cut off on that corner. Anyway, hope you like it. Um, I, it's big enough. And, the, and I try to tell you on the size on my handout, the size of the quilt. 
So this one is 56 by 64. So it's basically the same size as my pineapple quilt. Um, yeah, they just had the same number of blocks in a different way. But um, yeah, so it's, you could absolutely make smaller triangles or larger triangles. You just cut them the same way and lay them out the same way. And by the way, my layout probably doesn't match this exactly. And that's okay. You know, it's kind of an improv thing. So if you start to find mistakes or they're not mistakes, they're, they're changes. Um, but yeah, lay it out the way you want. Just want to make sure your points. My daughter came over and she was looking at it and she found two places where my points weren't working. So that was good that she, that she noticed that. Um, so that, you know, you kind of want to do that and have a cute little star on top. But other than that, it, you can, you've got, you can make changes to this. You can absolutely sew buttons on it and hand and put ornaments on it. I love that idea. Great idea. Especially if it's going to be a wall hanging. To be honest, I did not expect this to be this big. When I designed it, I was thinking it was going to be you know like this, but then four inch blocks, that's a lot of blocks. It got a lot bigger. But if you wanted to make it much smaller, of course, if you had a smaller die, if you're accu quilt, or you just wanted to make smaller squares, it would be some, a great wall hanging, and you could you could attach little things to it. Creative opportunities, never mistakes in sewing. You're right, Krista. Krista, you gotta you're gonna have to come back and see us on when uh, we start doing Saturday Saturday mornings. It'll be great to see you back. All right. I don't see any other questions, but if you got them, throw them at us. I haven't sewn my I haven't sewn my sleeve down yet. I just finished the binding about an hour before I got here, so sleeve will happen. All right. And we are going to I'm going to let you look at that for a few minutes while I talk about um, drawstring bags. If you've been with me since the beginning, you've heard me talk about this probably 13 times because I talk about this as close to Christmas as I can. But these are my drawstring bags that I make by the dozens, literally um, by the dozens. Um, it's a very simple drawstring bag, but I have a technique that if you've never used it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a game changer. Um, so this is, there's two, two poles, right, which makes a perfect drawstring. You don't have to put rick rack at the top, but that's a little design feature that I like to do. Okay, so I've got a quick little demo and we're going to do an overhead here. And here's another one. So let me just quick, quick reason for these drawstring bags. Um, when I when my kids were little and we had Christmas, the first year we had lots of Christmas gifts. There was Christmas paper, a pile up to here. There were three garbage bags full of paper and the green in me said, there's gotta be another way. This, this is ridiculous to have all this paper. I mean, you save some of the larger pieces, but it's still ridiculous. So here I am, I'm a quilter, I'm a sewer. I have lots of extra fabric, lots of scraps. So I started making these drawstring bags. Every year I make 20 to 40 more bags because every year those bags get farther and farther. This person gives it to this person, gives it to this person, and that is awesome, that's what I want. So I just keep making more and more. Um, at the end of Christmas, I will inventory. My, I've got some larges, some mediums, and some smalls. What, what do I need more of? come here for the 40% off Christmas stuff at the, in January, pick up some new fabrics, make a bunch of bags, have them ready for next Christmas. Um, the way I put tags on these, by the way, is I'll cut a little piece of cardboard and I have some files at home that I'll just print out to and from with a little Christmas tree or whatever, cut a hole in the cardstock and then run the hole, run the hole through the tag. And if you're lucky, if you save them from year to year, sometimes those tags, um, you can reuse them to Alex from mom, whatever, and then you can reuse them. So I wanted to show you this pile because this is my current pile at home. Anytime I have fabric, let's say this, this was a backing for a Christmas quilt, maybe a couple years ago, and it's a large print. And you know, what else can you do with something that you've got, you've got a couple rectangles for, um, and you've, you know, what else are you going to do with it? So I've, when I have a large print, that's kind of a one-off kind of thing. I'll try to cut whatever size rectangles I can get make out of it. And it goes into a drawer in the guest room. And the other day I was in that drawer in the guest. Oh, there's a hole. I got to fix that hole. Um, but anyway, um, so I was in the drawer in the guest room, like, oh, it's time to make some bags. So all these bags, these are all you know, leftover bits from quilts that I've made in the past, with lots of large prints that I just don't see myself using for anything else. 
as a commission quilt or with some some Etsy quilts. So yeah, so you can see large prints, all different sizes. And I'm going to assembly line these puppies and I'm going to make a bunch and maybe I'll even gift bags away as a gift for this year or something. Um, my, my daughter can sell them at a craft show. But here's how we do it. We're going to take two rectangles and move all that out of the way for now. Two rectangles and here they are right sides together. I like to use my serger to serge around the three sides, two sides and the bottom. And then I'm going to open it up and use my serger to go around the top to clean that up just because I have a serger and it's a nice way to finish off the top. But if you don't have a serger, um, you could certainly use, you can get a wave blade for a, um, your rotary cutter. You could use a zigzag. You could, all kinds of ways to finish that off, however you want to do it. Okay, so that's been done. I'm going to take some fusible Trico because I love fusible Trico for many, many reasons. But for this, I'll cut a little square off and I'll put one in the two places that I'm going to um, put my cut my put my eyelets. If you don't have an eyelet maker, you can use a buttonhole maker. I noticed my embroidery machine has buttonholes as well. So you could do that as well. Um, anyway, so they're stabilizing the fabric so the so the eyelet won't come out. So here's here it is. And by the way, there's a handout. I didn't realize I'd written one. And then the other day I was looking for something else and found the handouts. Like, cool. I don't have to figure out how to write this. So here's the, here's the trim that I like. You don't have to use rat tail. I found other types of, but I just like rat tail the best because it's very smooth and it works and it, as it, you're pulling, it just works really nicely. And it's, it's beautiful. And you can get rat tail in all kinds of colors. Not sure we have rat tail online, but we have a ton of colors on the ribbon. Um, I also sometimes will get really thin ribbon if it's a good price and I'll use that as well. But what we're doing here is we're measuring <clears throat> all the way around with a few extra inches, tie a knot. All the way around, a few extra inches, tie a knot. Just a simple overhand knot. Okay. What we're doing here is we're going to put our strings in before we fold the top down. And that's, that's my big difference that most people, most people sew the top down and then try to fish the string through. And I have much found a much easier way. And that's what I'm, that's why I'm working my way toward here. So I take this rat tail that's been folded in half with a knot and I take that fold and I pinch the fold. I want the knot to be on the outside. So I'm going to run this through like that, pinch the fold, run it through the other eyelet. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I did eyelets. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna stop and talk about eyelets for a minute. Right now, we don't have a lot of eyelets in the shop. We're gonna work on that. But in case you have an eyelet maker um, like that looks like this, and these are the eyelets, um, they're just a single piece. So it looks like a column with a little flat piece on the end. Um, and so that gets loaded on to the eyelet maker. Whoops. Oh, just drop that big time. We'll do another one. And I have them in black and white. And look out, look out, look at this. It's so old. I'm scared to use all of them. 50 cents for 300 eyelets. This thing is probably, I don't know, 40 or 50 years old, but I'm still, I'm still eating off of it. Um, so I loaded up my eyelet maker, but also I've done this demo a few times. Um, there's my fabric. There's my fusible tape. I like to cut a hole with a, with my, um, seam ripper which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And I cut like a V and then I load up my eyelet, push that through the hole and squeeze. Done. There's my eyelet, whoops. But it looks beautiful from the front. So I just built that one. So it's that simple. So you're squeezing down that column of metal. There's some grommets that have two different pieces to them, but that's not this. This is a single, a single piece that you, you squeeze it with the tool and you're done. Um, I have been gifted two or three of these, these through the years and I've used this one a lot because I've made, I'm not joking, hundreds of these bags. So there I put a grommet here and a grommet here. Again, if you don't wanna do the grommet idea, you can also use buttonholes. Um, so here's the magic right here. So pay attention. <laughs> So I ran, already ran this through. I'm gonna take this loop and I'm gonna run it around the bag. 
And then I'm going to take this loop, run it around the bag. And now I'm going to take one top and I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to do that all the way around, flip it around. I'm going to kind of tighten things up here. Sometimes I use my teeth if I'm not on camera. <laughs> and now I can sew this down all the way around in one one sewing. I don't have to I don't have to leave a hole. I don't have to get a bodkin. It's done. The one thing of course you want to make sure you don't run over with your with your needle and thread. You don't want to run over that that trim. You want to make sure you sew all the way around and it's loose so then you can you can close it tight like that. So again, just one more one more time. We are inserting the ribbon and then we're putting the fabric around it to make our drawstring. Hopefully that made sense. And it's also in your handout. If there are any questions about that? Love to see them. All right, I'm gonna get a quick drink. All right, sitting by the pool in Cancun. Sounds like a good place to be. All right, so that was the bag. I highly um, recommend that you make a few and then you find out how easy they are and then you can make a few more. But I've got I've got my work cut out for me. I've got a lot going here, but it's going to make some beautiful birthday gifts. East when we were we were camping at Easter one time, I didn't want to carry bags, so I made some Easter bags for the kids and that's where I put the Easter bunny, put all the Easter candy in. So lots of different uses for all these bags that you can you can use. And it's very green. You could be very proud of yourself. All right, now we're gonna talk about this quilt and I'm gonna pull another quilt up. It was too big for this space. So I'm just gonna show it to you. This thing is huge. Um, I don't even know where the... So here, the same exact idea. And there's not as many stars, of course. I forget how many stars I put in this, maybe five or seven or something like that. Um, I call this quilt Midnight in My Garden because, of course, there's lots of florals and then just a few stars. But the stars are built the same way. They're pretty wonky. They may not be as wonky as the quilt behind me. Where'd that star go? Here it is. Um, it may not be as wonky as the one behind me, but it's wonky, I promise you. And um, wonky is, again, is another improv technique. But this is uh, a scrappy quilt, of course, with big squares. And you could certainly not use, these are look like about six inch squares, but they could certainly be five or three or one or eight or 10 or however, whatever size scraps you've got. So that makes a really big quilt. Um, and then the back is pretty cool because I use leftover scraps for the back as well. My friend Lynn Spillane gave me a bunch of floral fabrics years and years ago, and I made three different quilts, and that was one of them. Um, so, but we're also going to talk about this quilt. This one I don't have to hold up, so we'll talk about it as well. But if you look at your handout, I have uh, one called M Midnight in My Garden, and the other one is called Maggie Stars. Um, some of you may know my friend Maggie Klingel. She was in the store one day when I was looking for, I brought in my hand-dyed fabrics. I hand-dyed these fabrics about 20 years ago. Don't ask me how. And I brought them all in. I, I told her I was looking for a backing for it. And she helped me look and she found this perfect background fabric. And so I told her, and because she helped me so much in her honor, I named this Maggie Stars. So that's what, that's where that name comes from. The border, I'll talk about the border and the binding in a moment, but for a moment, I wanna talk about these stars. So we're looking at a handout that looks like this. And again, the handout right before that is called Midnight in My Garden and also has a good demo on it. But we're gonna do an overhead on how to make those stars and then we'll do big picture again. So I've got a little, hopefully now everything's not too wrinkled. Ironed it on Monday. Let's see. Oh yes, good. Not too wrinkled. Okay. So here's here's a star. Here's and as you can see, none of the legs are the same length. So it's very wonky, very improv, and very fun. I think. Um, and you know, it's a lot less stress to make a wonky star than it is a perfect star, right? So here's what you're going to do. If you wanted to make this star, you need five pieces of star fabric, five squares. Well, let's say that's a, I think it's a four inch square. So we're going to say I need five four inch squares of, of star fabric. 
and then I need four squares of background fabric. And if, I don't know what you're going to put in there. You might put something else in. Um, it depends on how you design your quilt, but let's just talk about the basic star for starters. Um, okay, so here we go. We're going to take one of our squares, one of our one of our brown squares, and we're going to take, uh, I told you we need five of these. I'm going to put the center aside and the other four, you're going to cut them in half on the diagonal. So here's the square. You can imagine it was, it used to be a diagonal and now it's, I mean, it used to be a square and we've cut it on the diagonal. Okay. So now I'm going to lay this piece down and you know, you see, I didn't, it's not very, it's not very uh, straight at all. All I have to do when I, when I lay it down is just to make sure that when I flip this over, it completely covers this corner and it does. And I like it. And if you're not sure, you could put pins there and flip it over. You could put your fingers or you could just baste it with a really big stitch and flip it over. It's like, yeah, no, that didn't quite, you know, I'm, I'm missing some brown. So it's easy to take out and readjust and sew it down. So I've sewed this down, flip this over. That's number one. Number two is once I've done that, then I need to trim it off. So what the easiest way to trim it is just to flip it over and trim out all the extra white that you don't need. And you probably also want to trim out that extra backing uh, background fabric. All right, so that's the second step. The third step is we're gonna take another one of those triangles and do the same thing again, lay it down. It could be short and fat. It could be long and skinny. In this case, I decided to be long and skinny. And when I trim this out, I'm gonna have a short fat, I said long and skinny. It's gonna be a short fat leg. So here it is, long and skinny, short and fat. Long and skinny, short and fat. Not so fat, not so skinny, and those are about the same, but it's it's wonky. Each one can be different. That's, that's the point on that. So we're gonna do a big picture again here, Gabriella. And you can see now, there's my center square, short and fat, long and skinny, about the same, about the same. Here's short and fat, long and skinny. But each one you can, you can, this one's really, really short, but hey, I think it adds so much to the, the charm of it, having every single star different from the next. So this particular one, um, you have to figure out how you're gonna snug this into this and snug this into this. Um, so this is definitely a design wall quilt. This is not something you just pick up two squares and sew them together. You definitely have to um, put it up on the design wall or the bed or the floor or whatever to be able to get every single square has something happening to it. It's either uh, a star here from there or a star here from there. So you have to use your design wall to lay everything out. I love the secondary pattern of the background that happens between four stars so that you've got a bit of a pinwheel going there, which is very fun. Um, again, I hand dyed all these quilts ages ago with my Friday group. We had lots of fun, um, but I don't remember how we did it. And a couple more things to tell you about with this quilt. So we're gonna do a close up of this. So here I couched down some braided thread, braided, yeah, it's really thread. We have a few spools left. They're act, we're actually clearing them out, clearancing them out. They're from um, YLI, but they're couched down and in just a curve. And once I set up my first curve, and I think I drew it with a ruler, the first curve, and then I just kept following it. So couching is when you're zigzagging over yarn or thread. And it's funny because Pat is teaching a six day class right now as we speak on how to couch on the Solaris sewing machine. But really anybody, if you have a zigzag stitch on your machine, you can couch over yarn or thread or go to the yarn store and find some beautiful yarn and you could do a great border with that. Um, somebody asked me in my we're going to do look at that. Somebody asked me on Monday, how did you get the thread to go behind the stars? Well, the trick was that I pieced it in there. So I kind of had to do some marking. And you can see here I didn't I didn't match up my didn't match them up completely as as well as I wanted to, but it was a little fiddly. It was a little technical to try to get this to work. And then in some places 
I didn't even go under the star. I just skipped, skipped that. Um, there we go. I skipped it, but that's okay too. Design as a design feature. Um, C Lombardi. I don't know. It wasn't ice dyed. We just used I, dyes from um, uh, Dharma Trading and used buckets. But I did, like I said, I don't remember. Exactly. But it does look like ice dye, and it's true, it does. And then one more thing. I didn't don't have my Prairie Point de uh, demo with me, but these are little Prairie Points. And as you can see, they're the way they're folded. So I um, couched yarn through, uh, on, through the uh, Prairie Point square. And then when I folded it up in a certain way, then you get these really cute embellished Prairie Points. So I used the leftover fabrics from the... Um, from the stars to make my prairie points. And you can see they kind of go around in the binding. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. The quilting, I matched my thread to my fabric and I just did a free hand, free motion kind of starry thing going on there. So there's a lot, there's a lot of teaching points in this quilt. So I love pulling out and talking about it. There's a lot going on and it's just a happy quilt. So do we have any other questions about, um, this or anything else I've talked about so far, I have one more thing I want to talk about, and then we're going to pull names for the for the um, for the prize today. So a giveaway. So if you haven't hit your pound TTT in your comment, last chance to do that because we'll be doing um, giveaway in just a moment. But what I wanted to talk about was seam rippers. If you haven't gotten a new seam ripper lately, now might be a good time. They're good prices. Um, and we also call these reverse stitchers. We also call them uh, frog stitching. Rip it, rip it. And these are the two that I recommend um, the most. And they happen to both be from Clover. I'm going to do an overhead here. Uh, they both are from Clover. And this one, well, I like them both because even though this looks round, it's not. So when I put it down, it's not going to fall uh, down on the floor and hit me in the foot the way maybe some other ones might. Some of them are round and they just roll right off. This one, of course, is, is very flat and it's not going to fall down as well. They're both super sharp. Some say that this one has a finer point. I'd have to get my magnifying glass out, but I, yeah, maybe so. This one has a little bit of a finer point, but I think they both work great. I had a student years ago give this to me, and I've changed out the seam ripper a few times, but she gave this to me. So when I am um, teaching a class, we'll just do, look at me for a second. When we're teaching a class, this is the first thing that goes on. And then if students are having a problem, I can whip out my seam ripper and help them out. This also, I could just use it as scissors sometimes, so it's nice to have um, it's nice to have that as a um, yeah if you just use your seam ripper a lot it's nice to have it around your neck. So anyway, these are the two I recommend. I think they last longer than any other seam ripper I've ever used. They're not round, so they don't roll off your table. They're very sharp, but you know what? We all deserve a good quality seam ripper. That's that if we haven't if we haven't replaced it lately, it's probably time. So I've got those on my favorites page in case you're interested in grabbing a new one with the rest of your order. And if there's no other questions, we've, I see lots of people, lots of people have uh, commented with their hashtag TTNT. So I think it is time, Gabriella, to do this. So we're going to find out who, who uh, gets this beautiful, I want this. I want them both actually, maybe I'll win. Um, beautiful jelly roll and a beautiful canteen for one lucky person and we are spinning the dial as we speak and the winner is dragacorn b12 woohoo you're going to need to dragacorn you're going to need to send us a um, direct message so we know who you are I love the name, but that doesn't, isn't very helpful. So send us a direct message from Dragacorn so we know who you are and we can, we can get this to you. We'll either ship it to you or you can come in and get it, whichever you prefer. And thank you guys so much for, for joining me. And I can't wait to see you back here in January for all of those who work during the week. Now you can come on Saturday morning and we just love being together and hanging out together. If not, we'll see you live on January, I think it's 28th. Yes. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good holidays. Bye-bye.